Hello, welcome to part four of our Lent series, looking at uh, Tom Wright's book, God and the Pandemic. And this week we're looking at chapter four, which is called Reading the New Testament. And by the way, you probably gathered by now that uh, this week I'm indoors. This is the first one in the sermon, Sermons on a Selfie series that uh, comes to you from uh, the great indoors, as largely due to the fact uh, that the weather outside is appalling. At the moment, we've had in, uh, driving rain and furious wind. So uh, I thought, for the sake of uh, for the sake of good of decent sound quality, I should probably be indoors as a part, as opposed to outdoors today. So let's look at this uh, chapter together. And today we're looking at the New Testament and uh, more broadly. And when we read the New Testament, what do we find there in terms of understanding our present predicament uh, and, and a way forward in terms of our, our lives uh, as Christians and as, as people on this planet? Uh, and again, one of the things that Tom does in the first part of this chapter is to kind of look at big moments in the New Testament. For example, he starts off, he begins by looking briefly at the Passover, this uh, tremendous, this tremendously important Jewish feast of Passover, uh, important in the Old Testament, but important in the New as well. And he makes the point that you know, most of the New Testament writings refer back to it. Jesus, in all the Gospels, he inaugurates the kingdom. He, he prepares himself for the cross by means of a Passover meal at the time of Passover. And Tom Wright makes the point that um, nowhere in the Bible is the Passover. And, and just in case, um, just to recap, the Passover uh, was a kind of remembrance, a festival which remembered that the people of Israel had been slaves in Egypt, but then uh, through by God's mighty hand and Moses' leadership, they were delivered to freedom. And he makes the point that nowhere in the Bible is the Passover ever likened as a sign of judgment. The people weren't slaves in Egypt because of any wrong on their part. It wasn't because of their sin. And it wasn't a sign of God's judgment at all. There were other lessons to be learned uh, about the Passover, most notably that God is a God of deliverance, but it, it was never seen as a sign of anything. And that's a big, that's a, one of big Tom Wright's big kind of messages in this book, that we shouldn't go down rabbit holes, if you like, looking for signs of this or that. Tom Wright then uh, turns to the Acts of the Apostles, and he looks at a, a couple of chapters there. One chapter has to do with, I think it's in chapter 11, where there's a, a new church plant in Antioch, some 300 miles north of Jerusalem. And this particular church is interesting because it was made up of Jews and Gentiles. And it was a very prosperous, affluent city. Antioch at that time uh, was in one of the kind of I don't know, one of the top five cities in, on the earth in terms of population and culture and influence in the Roman Empire. And that's where this church is planted. And then a, a prophet called Agabus comes along and predicts a famine that will come across the whole world. And again, Tom Wright says what they didn't do in Antioch was say, well, is this famine a sign of God's judgment? Is this a sign that Jesus is going to return? Is this a sign that um, we've all sinned and we need to do something? He says, no, they don't do any of those things. That what the church in Antioch does is ask themselves three questions. And the three questions go something like this. Who's most at risk in this famine? Um, what can we do to help? And thirdly, well, who should we send? And Tom Wright says, uh, you know, you could look at this as just pure pragmatism. But he says, no, it's it's more than that. He believes this to be that kind of response, to be really a kingdom of God response. It's really about how can we partner with God? There's a need. There's a human need. Something is happening. There's suffering. So let's respond 
let's and let's send someone to to to, to carry out those intentions, if you like. And in this case, uh, they sent Barnabas and Saul, who will later become Paul, to do this work in Jerusalem, to take a gift to a church in Jerusalem, which was in great poverty. Um, and that's what the church in Antioch does. It hears about this famine, and it thinks of, they think about their brothers and sisters in Jerusalem, and they send a gift, and Barnabas and Saul go along. <music> And that brings Tom Wright to the kind of uh, the second part of the chapter, the substantial part of the chapter, really, which he calls really the groaning of creation. And he takes us to Romans chapter eight. So what Tom Wright is doing in this part of the chapter in Romans 8. And by the way, he refers to Romans 8 as Paul's finest chapter in his finest letter uh, to the Romans. And it is an amazing piece of work, isn't it? As a, as a piece of literature, as a piece of thought, um, as, as, an account, as an attempt on Paul's part, the writer, to engage in the mystery of suffering in the mystery of the universe and to pull in um, what God is doing in Jesus Christ and what he's doing in us. It's staggering. It's just staggering. It's, it's beautiful writing. Uh, it's, it's unparalleled, it seems to me. I can't think of anything else that matches Romans 8 in, in its scope and in the hope, uh, the scope of hope, if you like, that you can find in Romans chapter 8. And it ends, of course, does Romans chapter 8, as we just heard, with this um, great, uh, it's like a great trumpet blast of victory. You know, what, what then can separate us from the love of God in Christ? And of course, the resounding answer is nothing. No one can, nothing can. There, is, there isn't a single power or force anywhere in all of creation that can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. But Tom Wright, um, in that little section, pulls out some of the some of the aspects of this present suffering, and of course, what Paul does, he talks about our present sufferings, and then he goes on to talk about creation. He says the creation is groaning. It's groaning. It's, it's waiting in eager expectation for something to happen. Tom Wright translates that little ex the expression, the creation is waiting in eager expectation. He translated it as it's waiting on tiptoe. I love that. Creation is waiting on tiptoe in this present age, in this present suffering. So what is it waiting for? He says... Well, Paul says this, waiting for the children of God to be revealed. And see, this ties in with a message that is latent in this book, that the way God works, the way the kingdom of God works, the way creation works, the, word, the way everything was meant to work, is that men and women, humanity, if you like, under the call of God, is called to do something, called to partner with God and bring change. Ultimately, ultimately, says Tom Wright, says the Apostle Paul, that that comes when the, the, the renewal of all things, when finally Jesus comes again, there will be new heavens and a new earth. And the reign of God, and this is a mysterious thing, the rule of God will be done through renewed people human beings. And Tom is really hot on this uh, in this book and in so many of, of his other ones. I can think of one huge tome of his called The Resurrection of the Son of God. He really kind of debunks the myth, if you like, that somehow what, that somehow, you know, whether this, this earth is, is just about suffering and groaning, it's going to be destroyed. And then we get, you know, we, we get, kind of get beamed up to heaven where we'll be as float around the clouds. He says, no, no, that's not the point. The whole point of, of, of this, of, of what God's doing, 
is that through the resurrection of Jesus, there's renewal. It's the first fruits of a new creation. And the time will come when there will be a new earth and a new heaven. And it will be physical. It will be material. Um, we'll see uh, the grandeur of the planets and the universe that we've never, ever seen them before. And that men and women, transformed men and women, the transformed humanity will rule. Well, that's where he's going. It's a big thing. In the meantime, present sufferings and creation's waiting. It's waiting for the children of God to be revealed. <laughs> And so says Tom Wright, there are, there are, there are three things. There's this, it's like this fugue going on, a fugue m movement going on, to use a musical expression. One is the groaning of creation, the groaning of the world in suffering. There's a convulsion going on, has been forever and ever. Secondly, there's the groaning of the church, and thirdly, and most mysteriously, there's the groaning of the spirit within the church, within the world. In other words, we're part of a suffering world and we are, we are ourselves in that suffering. And says Paul, isn't just about the world groaning, there's the groaning of God in this. It's an amazing passage, this, because he talks about prayer as the Apostle Paul, that uh, sometimes there are times in life when all we can do is groan in prayer. And it's the Spirit of God within us who groans. It's a deep thing, this. That on our way to, on, a, on the way to victory, if you like, on the way to God's final triumph, we pass through suffering. And in that suffering, says the Apostle Paul and says Tom Wright, we will find God there. Now again, this challenges some of our notions about God. This challenges some of our notions about his sovereignty because so many of us have grown up with a notion that sort of God is up there somewhere and he's unmoved. He's, you know, God's in his heaven. All's well with the world, says the, said the poet Robert Browning. He's up there, way down here. And Paul says, no, it's not like that. Um, we're going to find God groaning with us. But he also says something else. And this, I find this very challenging. And... Uh, because somebody might say, well, hang on, Gethin, uh, a bit further on, he says uh, that all things work together for, for good to those who love God. That's what he goes on to say in Romans 8. It isn't that the negation of all of this? So somehow uh, all of this, all this suffering uh, and all this stuff is, is basically all right. And um, we just take it on the chin. Uh, and because in the end, it all pans out for us. Uh, so that's all we've got to do. We've just got to man up, woman up, and uh, ultimately God wins and, you know, we get to heaven kind of thing. Well, Tom Wright disputes, disputes that kind of narrative because he says, no, we, we find the groaning God in our praying now. So what does it mean that all things work together uh, for good to those that love God? Well, Tom and I would encourage you to read this because it, 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 it is quite a detailed argument. He kind of looks at that verse and uh, points to recent scholarship and says, we've got the emphasis wrong because we make it sound as though all things work together for good to those who love God. In fact, he says, what Paul is actually trying to say is that God is at work. God is at work for good in his people. In the all things. He's at work. But more than that, says the Apostle Paul, uh, says Tom Wright and the Apostle Paul, he says that um, the, the, this, this little word that work, that God is at work in all things, isn't the normal word for work. There are lots of words for work in the Greek language. Um, but there's this particular 
word that's used here, sun ergo, work with. That's what it means. Happens a number of times. Paul will use this word, for example, when he's talking about his colleagues, my fellow workers. It's that word, sun ergo. And so Tom Wright says what, what this passage seems to be getting at is that God is at work in all things, but he's, wor and, but he's, he's working with. He's working with those people who are doing what he wants. He's working with those who sense the call of God to groan in prayer. He's working with those who sense the call of God to work against injustice and for justice. He's, wor he's working with those who have uh, seen colossal human need and want to alleviate that pain in some way. That's what Paul seems to be getting at. That as the world groans, as we groans, as, as the Spirit of God within us groans, and we give ourselves to God's purposes, then we'll find him. We'll meet with God in his weakness, and he'll give us his power to do his will. And in some ways, we've seen that, haven't we? I mean, I'm going to show you a clip now of what this looks like in practice. It's a guy called... Pastor Mick Fleming from Burnley. And he, along with another vicar in Burnley, have been really seeing to meet the needs of that particular city in lockdown. And here is an example of, I think, what it means like to groan with God in the face of this need. It's been acknowledged by government and other public bodies that the pandemic has hit vulnerable groups and those living in deprived areas the hardest. Official figures for England show that the overall death rate between April and June this year in the poorest areas was nearly double that of the least deprived. The government says it is committed to reducing deprivation and has spent over £100 billion in welfare support this year and that they are ensuring that councils have the appropriate resources. Our special correspondent Ed Thomas has spent time in Burnley and reports now on some of those trying to cope there with unemployment and with mental health issues. I love the poor because I know I'm the poor and as long as I breathe I'll serve the poor. No need to push, there's plenty. You see all these people, they have children. Hungry children. It's hard to keep your distance when you're cold and hungry. Politicians say that it was a level, this coronavirus. It's a lie, because if you're poor, you've got no chance. There's tuna pasta bacon, all sorts in here. It's very really hard to get food for myself, because I've got much money on me, and I can't go out anywhere. A couple of days food is mean everything to us. Well, I've no parking. Every time you get any money, it disappears as fast as you've got it. With the coronavirus as well, with the reduction in wages, it's not easy to cope. So this means you can eat? Today. Yes, yeah, you can eat and it helps out wherever you're stuck. I think they've all got chocolate here, brother. And all this is laid on by Pastor Mick. The need's massive, absolutely colossal. This is the church I represent. The level of need here in Burnley at the moment is, I think, unprecedented and it's upsetting. We've got some, some bread as well, yeah? For too many, the legacy of coronavirus is not only sickness, but desperation. Visiting a, a family who had no carpet, who had no settee, who had no gas, had no electric, they had no food. I broke my heart because um, nobody cared for them. They fell through the crack. Pot noodles, that kind of stuff, all right. I go into houses and I sometimes have children ripping the bags open to get at the food as I'm carrying them to the door. Uh, and it's not all right, that. That's not all right. And it wasn't as bad as that before the virus. The biggest part of coronavirus has been the loneliness. Most days, Pastor Mick helps people like Viv. She's 55. I keep trying to force myself to eat. I'd stop eating for about a week. I just ended up collapsing on my bathroom floor. Living in isolation became too much. It's just like brought it all back. 
I've lost my husband, I've buried two of my babies. I gave birth to them, all I wanted them to do was cry, and they didn't cry. Yeah. No mother has to go through that. The coronavirus brought all this... Yeah, back. it's brought every moment back to me. When you collapsed, what went through your mind? Just let me go, let me, you know, my number must be up. I thought my time were up. And Pastor Mick says he's hearing more and more of these stories. We're trying to fetch a bit of hope to people's lives. The unfairness of health deprivation. I feel angry because people aren't listening. What has coronavirus meant for your care? It stopped it. I'm supposed to have a blood test done once a month for my cancer count. Nobody's been and done it. Six months. I don't want to be a drain on the system that's already dying because I'm already dying. We can't do nothing to help. We've just got to sit back and watch it. There's not many people lose a child and there's even less that lose two. The first lady of our food bank came and um, she broke down. Her daughter had uh, killed herself. We pray for Jesus' name. <laughs> you have to try and find words. Without their support, what would have happened to you? Me, well, I'd would... probably be where my daughter is now. Up there. I probably would have took me on that if it worked for him. Together, they're the hope for thousands through this crisis. <laughs> so... Do you know, it's... um. You carry, you carry people's burdens. You, you try to tell them that it's, it's all right. This is so, so upsetting. That was uh, Father Alex Frost ending that report there by our special correspondent, Ed Thomas. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we are amazed at Romans 8. There's so much to it, so much depth to it, Lord. But we do recognize, Lord, that um, we are part of a groaning world. And we ourselves are groaning. We don't know what to say, really, Lord. But words, uh, words elude us at the, moment, at the moment. We're not entirely sure what to say. There are, because there are no words left faced with such loss and such difficulty. And when we hear about people being uh, tortured in so many parts of the world, when we hear about the Uyghur people, when we learn about the people in Myanmar, when we learn about the sufferings of those imprisoned unjustly, when we read about those whose uh, lives have been rendered uh, almost unlivable because of the colour of their skin by white people. Or we're, we're ashamed and we're grown, oh God, when we learn about people who have been judged and cast out because uh, their, their sexuality or, or, or orientation is different to, every, to other people's. We're ashamed, Lord, and we groan and we think, Lord, what can we do? So, Lord, we just turn to you. We turn to you, God of love, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we say we give ourselves to you. We give ourselves to be change agents, agents for good and for love in this world till he comes again. In Jesus' name, amen.